Uh, I'm going to start off with a little story. Years ago, I was in a movie called Love, Valor, Compassion. And the end of that movie is myself and six wonderful actors go in skinny dipping in a lake, uh, in a quarry. We shot this film in Beauharnois, which is about 20 miles north of Montreal, in the middle of the summer. But we went into that lake at 1 o'clock in the morning. And I don't know what temperature it was. I can only tell you. It instantly took our breath away. None of us could take a deep breath. And we're supposed to look like we're frolicking and having the best time. We, there was a 10-minute magazine of film on the cameras. So for 10 straight minutes, we're in this water, no dialogue, having a delicious good time. <laughs> And chilled and pained to the bone. Yeah. We come out, we are miserable, we are shaking. You can feel it in your bones. And they go, take two, and we have to go back in. And all I can tell you, on top of everything else, none of us had a genital of any Sherlock kind. Sherlock Holmes couldn't Male find genitalia Male or female anywhere, or nothing. anything in between. Sherlock Holmes Shrink would be looking <laughs> with the spyglass going, there's nothing. So to me, the idea of going into cold, cold voluntarily, Right, is anathema. Really? No, really. Really? No, really. Really? So we yes. were both on Adam's show, which is which was Adam Carolla's show, which is which is great. I love Adam. It's, it seems to be a popular show. Somewhat. Yeah. Somewhat, I think. And he had just mentioned, because we were talking about the cold plunge, that he gets up and gets into cold water. And I wanted to know more about the cold plunge. Was it a tech thing? Like, is it these tech guys came up with the Silicon Valley? What's the history? I know Wim Hof has this thing that he does. Um, Who, who's that? Wim Hof, famous Wim guy, Hoff? swim under. Wim yeah, Hoff? yeah, he does, climbs mountains, does stuff without well, you're shoes on. you throwing that name around like it's, you know, chicken. Wim Hof. So everybody it's, it's, knows Wim Hof. So I got it. And Adam's the kind of guy who I'm always fascinated with because he does stuff. I do nothing. I lied to him. He collects car cars. He uh, does TV shows. He writes movies. He's very active. He was the father of the broadcasting industry, you know. He was in it just about before anyone else. Guinness World Book of Records. Yeah, I think still. Yeah. So we want to get Adam on because I wanted to find his take because I knew he, didn't, he probably had an unusual take about why he decided to do the ice plunge. I, I have a feeling that it has to do with mental health. You think? Yeah. I don't, with Adam, I wouldn't guess that necessarily. I've met Adam. All right, I have, all right, all right let's, let's, well, let's see. He's there. He looks very good today. You look really handsome today. In the Heather, in the Heather hoodie. It's handsome, very powerful nice. man. Look at you. Thanks for having me. We're in Howie's studio, which we broadcast from. Adam was on, and I also then saw him say, doesn't use deodorant, doesn't take a shower, that the pool is enough. It well cleans, aware. cleans, We're well clean, aware. Clean, oh, cleans, cleans everything. So you had a unique take on that. Um, why did you start doing, what What clicked with you to say, I'm going to do this ice plunge? I'm going to try it. Well, I, I heard enough people, it's probably been about six, seven years now. I heard enough people talking about it, saying it was good for you. And then I sort of followed down the path of everything you don't want to do is good for you. You know, <laughs> eating Eating broccolini instead of fudge <laughs> is good for you. Working out versus watching TV is good for you. Hugging people and telling you you love them. Very painful, but good. Good, okay. You know, and so there's, I, I sort of subscribe to the sort of nature, you know, when you're sweating, when it's hurting, when you don't think you can do another rep, you do another rep and that's what's good for you. And so if getting into a, frozen swimming pool every morning <laughs> is miserable it must be good for you so wait is the is the theory in order to do extreme things in life you got to force yourself to do extreme things yeah i i feel there's a physiological benefit of it that the aforementioned wim hof could tell you about or other people could tell you about i'm not really interested in the physiological benefit of it that is a happy byproduct of it. I'm more focused on you starting every day by doing something you don't want to do <laughs> and sort of setting the table for the rest of the day. Well, well I do that. I don't want to get out of bed, too, man, but I'm not. <laughs> yeah. You seem to. Do you really. I'm serious now. Do you gravitate towards things that are challenging or uncomfortable for you? Do you like that sort of hurdle? Yes. You do? Yes. Yes. I, you know, people, 
you know, they always go, what made you want to do Dancing with the Stars? I go, nothing made me want to do Dancing with the Stars. I didn't request to be on Dancing with the Stars. I would have been happy to never been on Dancing with the Stars. But they asked me, and it scared me. And once I realized I was scared, which I definitely was, uh, then I realized now I need to do it. Because otherwise, I'm just sort of running away from this thing that I'm not good at, which so, is dancing. So have you done, have, all right, so I'm, uh, I, I don't think I could skydive. I have a fear of heights. Have you done stuff like that? I, I haven't done a lot of, you know, things that would, you would, you know, constitute as sort of extreme sports. But if you invited me to go skydiving, I would say yes. Really? I would just, wow. Just on the off chance, I would run into Tom Cruise. Sure, and we could strike <laughs> yeah. up a conversation. Yeah. Or strap yourself, tell me to go together in, in tandem because this way. So if you think no, I'm, I'm, if, I'm talking midair, I'm not even talking about the plane ride. God, I'm talking. Just, there's a 50 50 chance he will be next to you if you're falling. <laughs> you just look over and it's like he, son ten, of a, he tends son to of be a up fish. there for some reason. My God, yes, he's yeah. there already. Yeah, he's he's hanging out. So what other stuff did you say yes to or seek out that was really outside your comfort zone that surprised even you? Well, like when I was younger, I entered into the Golden Gloves competition to box out here in L.A., and that scared me. Uh, wow. I recently did The Mass Singer, and I can't sing. <laughs> I can't sing as any, you know, dancing and singing are the same for me. You know, I'm no Tommy Tune. So <laughs> not going to happen, but you did it. Jason, I'm one of nine people. Tommy Toon actually gave me my Tony Award. So Jason, is, you know who Tommy Toon is. I do. Is, I but do. You don't know who Wim Hof is. When Wim Hof, I only know because I went deep in the research of this. And Wim Hof has done amazing things like climbed Everest, but he's also done outrageous things like hike in 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 an ice in a, in a terrain with no shoes, and can can control through his breathing and mentally. How his reaction but to that? He's why? like Tony Robbins in the cold. Is what. He's but weird. why do that? Because he can. Because I guess, like Adam said, some people outside of the box is really outside of the box. But I can. I could probably chew glass. It's just not good for me. Well, but it would be good I for the can podcast. Do it. It would be good for this episode of the podcast. We would get such tune in. By the way, Adam, you've been. He's laughing. You've been doing the podcast since two thousand nine. Is that? You really were kind of like one of the first guys in, were you not? There wasn't much yeah, happening in one this of world. Them. Yeah. No. But, but the interesting thing, because I watch you and I kind of know you a bit and, and, and listen to you for years, I don't think you do stuff to go. How many downloads am I going to get on this? You don't. You don't live your life that way. I'm guessing. Yes. No, I, I don't really have expectations before I enter whatever endeavor I've gotten involved with. I just base it on, do you want to do it or do you not want to do it? And is it what you do? And would you do it for free? It's kind of a one of the yardsticks to kind of measure, should you be doing it? Would you be doing it anyway? And if the answer is yes, then I just move forward. But the entire field of comedy for me was always that I just wanted to get off a construction site and into a building with a microphone <laughs> and do something. Right. And that, that, that was about it. I, I never really thought about compensation or legacy or name recognition. I, I just wanted to leave this one place, go someplace else and do something else. But and you say, I'm you, sorry. Was that characteristic? sort of always who you were even as a as a kid or was it something that a, a, a sort of a, ch a change of life moment well when i was a kid i was kind of along for the ride because my family was pretty broken and they didn't have any money and i was just sort of a recipient of my environment you know we didn't have money we couldn't i couldn't travel mm. i couldn't try extracurricular things i i just sort of hung out because right. that's what you do when you're 13 and you just sort of hang out and then when i got out of high school i didn't go to college i i knew i had to work i, I needed money i needed to support myself so i just sort of took whatever job was open and that was construction labor and yeah, i did that for a number of years and once i sort of got out of survival mode because survival, it's hard, you know, when you get pushed off the back of a cruise ship 
<laughs> the only mode you're in is survival mode. Right. You're not yeah. in, oh, I, I'm thinking about starting a tech company. <laughs> you know, you're thinking about finding <laughs> land. You, you, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so yeah. I was in find land mode from, you know, age three to age 23. But once at age 23, I'd found, you know, some land. I had a job. I drove a truck. You know, I could I could keep the lights on in my apartment with yeah. three roommates. Then w once I got survival, that part down, I started thinking, now what's what would thrive mode look like? What would what would it look like to have a life where you you just didn't exist, but you actually did things and had experiences and, and met people that were interesting. What what would that life look like? And yeah. that's when I sort of embarked on the second chapter. And that's a great, well, you went growlings. You, you started doing improv, you started to find, and the amazing thing about your career too, is that you, you were calling K-Rock as a fan, as a listener. That's how you were discovered, which is pretty insane way to go, right? What are the chances? That, that you do it, and then you train Jimmy to box. I mean, out of nowhere, you said, I'll volunteer to train Jimmy to box somebody. And from that, you got a career, yeah? Yeah, I, you know, I train, I, I, well, I was working as a boxing trainer, so it, you know, wasn't completely out of left field, uh, but I wasn't calling in to train Jimmy to box. I was calling in to train Jimmy or the guy or his opponent. Oh, anybody. I, I, didn't know, I didn't know either one of them. <laughs> no favoritism. Uh -huh. No, and Jimmy wasn't Jimmy. I, I didn't know who he was. But so you were smart. I, did you, did you maneuver lucky. it, though? But once you got in, were you, were you, was it a plan? Did you see openings and say, I'm going to do that, now I'm going to do that? Was it all kind of every shot I saw, I was activated and really went for it, or was it really luck? Well, I... I got in intentionally to see the radio station and to physically, I just physically wanted to see the inside of the radio station and, and know how it worked to do radio. Cause I was inter interested in radio. And once I met Jimmy and Jimmy made it clear that he thought I had some ability uh, and that, that maybe there's something I could do. Then my next, mode was what how can i convince jimmy to let me do something on this morning radio <laughs> show kevin and Bean. bingo so it was it was you were working it at that point and then all yes. of a sudden and then the bit came about and then love line and then your guinness world you don't talk about it much but your guinness world book of records as far as downloads what was the amount of downloads that you got for uh, that for for the on <laughs> podcast I, there's a plaque on the wall somewhere here, but it's not in front of me. So I, I don't know. I just remember thinking this is a, Oh, I would have a, a doable record. Oh, it was Billy, yeah. but it's Billy, but isn't it weird? We sit in a room. I did radio for forever. You don't see the audience. You have no sense. You, Jason are playing to an audience. You don't see the audience when you're in radio podcasting yeah. and he's got a, a billion down over a billion downloads. So you don't know where you're going, where you're going to run into people who are fans of, of what you're doing or what they heard or when they heard it or how because with podcasts you can also listen to something that's not that's historic that's from three years ago or five years ago so somebody comes up and i love that episode and you don't even remember you did it i mean it's kind of a fascinating world uh, as know, far as podcasting uh, but you used to do that you told me when i was on that you were trapped in the construction job and you used to listen to radio to escape all day long that was your that was your respite yeah, I I was verbal, but I was working in a very menial kind of blue collar, repetitive job of construction, and I literally wanted to hear voices. And it was like when people turn the radio on before they leave the house because they think it's going to keep their dog company. <laughs> you know, if they could just hear Something. human voices right. in right. the next yeah. room, maybe they'd be at ease if there's a thunderstorm blowing in. Um, so for me, yeah, I always listen to talk radio, all forms of talk radio, uh, my whole, my whole life. And I, I was always attracted to it, but I, I didn't really know why. I just thought I'm enjoying this exchange of ideas of, of all the different groups and all the different, you know, I would listen to religion on the line with Dennis Prager in the eighties and I'm an atheist. <laughs> I just wanted to hear people talk. Right, right. And I get that. It's also the most one of the most intimate mediums too. People, you're just talking to that person. They they're getting you in their head, in their head, 
and they really feel like they know you in a way. Adam, what you know, you really were one of the the biggest and earliest successes in this. Do you have any particular take on what's happening in podcasting, where it's going, what it's become, what's good, what's bad? You know, it's just, it's become an industry, bef- and you were there really before it was that. Well, what I've heard is, you know, when I started, there was a handful of podcasts. I heard the other day there were like 5.5 million yeah. podcasts that were out. Uh, currently and it'll probably take the same trajectory as automotive like american automotive manufacturing in the 30s or something which is there was no automotive manufacturing then there was ford then there were a whole bunch of other independent manufacturers you know duesenberg and cord and white and you know if you just go to leno's warehouse and you'll see a whole (laughs) bunch of american cars you've never heard of right and then at some point it so it got saturated and then it got kind of reconsolidated a little bit which is the you know the ones that weren't working kind of sloughed off and the ones that were working remained and so i think we're going to go through a sort of a ebb and a flow yeah. process so it probably went from underrepresented to oversaturated to some sort of merit based you know here's what we're left with in a in a few years of all the podcasts you've done the thousands of hours is there something that stands out is there one or two where you go this was pretty neat for me Pretty amazing. In terms of having a guest on the show. Or something you found out. Guest or a topic or, yeah. I had one of the surviving members of the band, Leonard Skinner, walk me through in great detail the plane crash, what happened, who died, how it worked, where he went, you know, the, the entire process of that flight yeah that fateful right. flight the flight where half the band died where they were sitting on the plane what essentially killed them oh. and th- I, it was haunting and interesting and the other one just sort of on that subject is uh i was talking i interviewed the seal team member that killed bin laden And it Uh literally just walked me through that night the same way, you know, up the staircase, who was in front of him, what they were yelling, who was behind him, who they encountered on the second floor, the women, you know, all of it. And it just in, in, in the in the kind of detail that you obviously couldn't get to if you were telling the story on a late night TV show or many other forums, you know, all the time in the world to really go through in very fine detail granular detail of live it that flight yeah killing bin laden you know and and you were there uh, i mean when i feel like i felt like i was there for both those those events having, and having heard that did zero dark 30 sort of get it right in their depiction of it robert o'neill by the way is the name i'm i'm yeah. trying to think of of the uh navy team leader um it was zero dark. Yeah, I well, I think those guys that we sort of say they got some of it right. They didn't get other parts, you know, right. But yeah. I, I think I, I recall him saying that was pretty close. Yeah, I remember, he, yeah go ahead, son. I, I, I was going to change the subject, you know, because I'm, I'm thinking about all the things you do that you do in a sort of unique and way. And I want to make sure I have this right because I've never seen you do stand up live, but I catch a lot of you on on some of the comedy channels on on uh, Sirius XM and it seems to me that you are doing a spontaneous act that people will throw a topic or a title at you and you riff is that is that correct is that am i perceiving that correctly part of what i do when i do stand up is hand out ping pong balls to the audience before the show they write one word on the ping pong ball and then the ping pong balls are collected and put into a bingo hopper and then we spin them around. Someone on stage does it at the end of the show and pulls the ball out, whatever the word is, then I must do a stand up bit 
on the, the word that's on the ping pong ball. How did you... How did you know you could do that? How did you even come up with the thought of wanting to try and do it? Because I, I understand you you like the things that are challenging, potentially dangerous, and that certainly sounds like a fine example. But how did you know you could, that you had that skill? Because it's really good, by the way. I, I, those are really, really funny observations. And not only funny, but they they have a craft to them where it's, it has sort of a, a natural flow, like a beginning, middle, end to the routine. It's it's almost it's almost as if it were crafted and written, but there's it's clear that you are doing it spontaneously. Well, thanks. Um, it was Jimmy Kimmel's idea, essentially. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> He's always just said, "You can just talk about anything." Any, I remember. I remember somebody, he, I was sitting around with Jimmy once and, 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 and a reporter for some reason or something. And he said to this guy, Adam could do, Adam could turn anything into a comedy bit. Anything, anything. If you, you just bring up something, he'll, he'll turn it into a comedy bit. And the guy was drinking a coffee and he had a little plastic stir stick in it. And he pulled out the stir stick and he said, do a routine on the stir stick. And I did 20 minutes on a stir stick. <laughs> And that's when Jimmy went, all right, well, then he can do anything. So you're so confident. Man. You're confident on a stage that you can do it. Doesn't matter what, what you pick up. You know, I'm confident in I, that I can do it, but I will admit that just like with any form, there are tricks, there are techniques. You know, it's not all uh. as pure as it may sound. Uh. You know, there are times when somebody brings something up and you think, man, I got nothing. I got nothing for this. And then you go, you know, I got nothing for this. I'll tell you who else doesn't have anything. My brother-in-law. Right, right. <laughs> Let me tell you about this. I was just going to say, swivel stick, <laughs> the to, pivot. Swivel the pivot. stick to coffee to <laughs> buffets. I got it. You just you go where you got to go for survival. And the audience thinks you're doing a the bit, thing like, that's on the ball, right, right, you left right. it. just slid into something you <laughs> could do, yeah. which is, but now if Jason listens, and I thank you, you will hear that 92% of the time, whatever's on the ball shall be yeah. addressed directly. You bet. But, well, look at that. He, see, he, he, for your ego, you had to go back and go, however, yeah, no, the percentages I'm are you, really have, high. I'm sure yeah, I no, have heard almost two dozen separate clips of you doing it, that and it's, it's not sleight of hand it, it but there are occasions where you will use little massages and techniques and things things of that nature much like sometimes when you see a comedian doing crowd work he's not really doing total spontaneous right. crowd work he's doing like jokes forcing that a car work for right. crowd work right yeah. right. Mm -hmm. right well and, and by the way because of the improv and because you've done radio for a long time, the skill set you get is you have to be really interested, number one, when you're listening to people talk. And you also have to be a cynic. You have to be, it's almost like Seinfeld does it beautifully as far as observational. But you're like, I, I look at everything. Writes, I look at it. He, 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 he really he, writes it. I don't have the discipline yeah. to write it, but I'm fascinated about everything. So right. you're that way. <laughs> I mean, I laughed because I was looking <laughs> and researching today and I saw some Carlin like lines. You shouldn't be eating anything to take six minutes to microwave. <laughs> we laugh out loud when you. That's a brilliant. It's a brilliant that. Speaking of sleeping bags, has anything ever had a less creative name? <laughs> that's brilliant. That's, that's and funny. I remember being friendly with George. The thing that made me laugh about George not was just his brilliance when he did the long riffs and he had them timed out. But my favorite line I told him was, "Don't ever go to a dentist with blood in his hair." I mean, that just that's, that's you know because it's so. It so gets you gets your attention, right. and it's almost right. like a, a palate cleanser. And then George would go back to political stuff, whatever. But that's what I feel like. You, I laughed out loud. <laughs> Is there ever a worse name than that? So let's get back though for a minute to the ice plunge. Do you do anything else like the ice plunge? That's that's trendy. Do you eat only food that's brown? Do you do you do the intermittent fasting? Is that trendy? Do you do the uh, the <laughs> jump rope? Uh, you know, there's so much stuff. Are there any other stuff that you do that's kind of this trickle down from the tech giants because they love they love doing intermittent sleeping and eating weird stuff because they have the money to try it. Yeah, I don't do anything that would be considered, you know, 
off the beaten path like the cold plunge is. I do do the intermittent fasting. Oh, there we go. And that's a thing that I, I, I did realize that about 70% of eating was sort of habitual and emotional. You know, I found myself, I'll, I'll give you a good example. If you schedule a lunch hour into your day, you will eat lunch every single day. <laughs> if you don't schedule lunch in, you, you won't eat it. lunch and you don't really miss it. You really don't. You, 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 it takes about a week to sort of, you know, transfer into that mindset. But you really, I don't schedule lunch. I just go to work and then I work and then I go home and I eat dinner and I don't, I don't miss it. And I realize that lunch, when I work construction, I'd show up on the job site at 7 a.m. and start thinking about lunch. Right. But because I hated the job. Right. And, and I couldn't wait to just sit down on a pile of drywall and eat a burrito for half an hour, <laughs> considering what I was doing. Right. But I realized it was more psychological than it was physiological. And there are those of you who are listening who go, no, I get low blood sugar. I can't, you know, whatever. Drink some coffee in the morning, put some heavy cream in it, drink, drink a cup or two and leave the house. You'll be fine. And you don't need so it. you're down to one meal a day. I pretty much. But my one meal a day is not kale the way I'm <laughs> wired. And just so you yeah. should know, a lot of this for me is like. I am going to forego lunch and I am going to forego breakfast, but I'm I'm not eating seaweed for dinner. I'm having a pizza. Right. And a beer. Like I'm going to join myself. Yeah. But I I will delay it so I can. And yeah. what was kale? I never I don't remember what year did kale appear? Same year as tilapia. Yeah, they we that's asked, a made up fish. That's not year. a real fish. There's they, no that's right. When I was growing up there was not a tilapia in the sea. All of a sudden Everything's a tilapia. And my mother never said kale. Let's have kale for dinner. What right. was it? Didn't Do we exist. know what it was? It's somewhere in between cabbage and lettuce and, and unnecessary. Do you know where kale you know, was? You know, it was underneath the potato salad and the coleslaw. And the it, was yeah. it, was, it was a garden. It, it, yeah. it so was a garden. Yeah. So it's like chicken wings, somebody said, don't. Chinette. They had, See, they had when kale. potatoes was was a, don't <laughs> throw this out, make it a thing. Right. Kale was a substrate that you would put an ice cream scooper of tuna salad on. <laughs> that's right. That's exactly that's all oh, it was. God, I love that's that's right. See, that's one of my favorite things, try salads. Try salads at a deli? You do order that. I've try, I love the try salad because then you can bring it home. And, and it's it always the egg and the tuna, and then you, you vacillate. And I'm up on the third. Right. The third, yeah. the third that's is my the wild life. card. It's like, yeah, it's like Russian roulette. Yeah, what's what am I going to do? What am I going to do today? What am I doing? So. I have a theory that... <laughs> People eat way too many turkey sandwiches and not nearly enough egg salad sandwiches. And I say that people like egg salad sandwiches. They just don't order them. I order well, them because, all the time. Because, because, I don't know about you, but I grew up in a row home in Philly. We didn't have a ton of money. You made an egg at home. You don't order it. To order it out, I can have it at home. Why am I paying? My father would go, why are you paying to have an egg out? We can have an egg at home. Eat something you can't have at home when you eat out. I had pressure. We used to go to the buffet and we would rehearse because it's the shrimp. Don't load up on that. I, I yeah. still walk into a buffet today and I get nervous because I hear my right, dad. Yeah. It was like a military maneuver. Yeah. You're wasting. What do you have? Lettuce. Rice. Yeah. Right. Salad. They want you to do. Salad. Yeah. What are you? An idiot? You're an idiot. Yeah. You're an idiot. We have salad at home. You, we used to have yeah. assignments. You get. You're doing seafood. You're doing meats. <laughs> You're doing interesting vegetables. Don't get stupid vegetables. <laughs> there, yeah. yeah, so egg salad. I love egg salad out. By the way, working I do in too. Oh, my I God. Yeah, it's fantastic. I love it. I love it. You know it what else I, I always get when I'm out? Rice pudding. Oh, wow. Fantastic. That's, that is a power move. That's, uh, you bet. Rice That's pudding. a discerning gentleman. Well, but Adam used to be like me, worked in a radio station for a lot, a lot yeah. of years. And what would happen at a radio station, if you get hungry there, your choices are a ligament sandwich which is like meat that you can't, it's like a Michelin tire and two pieces of bread. I, I, you don't know what it is. And then bad snacks. They never had anything. They didn't have egg salad in the machine at a radio station. It, it was always a lig ligament sandwich, right? Didn't you eat from the, 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 the carousel of death at the radio station? We didn't even have a carousel. We had a coffee maker and a powdered substance that didn't say creamer. <laughs> it literally said whitener. Right. Oh my White, God. Whitener. Whitener, you're right. It you're wasn't right. They, they didn't want to be sued by the dairy council <laughs> and say the word cream. Whitener. Whitener. Uh, I literally we're going to change the color of your coffee. 
And that people, was their only promise. And I always felt that people made that in a plant wearing headgear, like hazmat suits, because they didn't want to breathe it in. And I'm pouring it in my coffee. Like, See, like but you time. guys, I would have, I, I would look so much different today if I hadn't done Seinfeld, and if Seinfeld hadn't been so successful, because you know, Dude. we had catering. I was in, I was in Jerry's office when a caterer came in to audition for the job of being the caterer for the season. And she asked, what is the budget I'd be working with? And Jerry looked at her like she had three heads and went, unlimited. Unlimited budget for catering. Wow. So we would have... Let me, let me, let me tell it, because <sighs> coming, coming like to the promised land. So I've worked on sitcoms before. You have a barrel of licorice, that red licorice, red vines. You have a couple of bars of like Nature Valley bars, an apple, a banana from three weeks ago, and that's about it. I go to visit yeah. Jason at Seinfeld. First off... It's like Steven Spielberg when you opened that warehouse and it went forever. The table, yeah. you couldn't see the end of it. And it was terrines of stuff. It was like guys were messing around just to see if they could get like a side of beef. It was anything. It was full catered meals twice a, twice a day. Well, yeah. Full catered Hard meals. Hard to say now. And it was, oh I, I gained, Number I gained one 40 show on TV. pounds Number over one show on nine TV. seasons. Yeah. So before we go, are there any other, so the ice plunge, we know you do, even though, but. You seem like a guy who enjoys, this is what I'm getting from you. You are very comfortable doing the uncomfortable if you think there will be a side benefit to it. Of any kind. I, I'll further that by saying, <laughs> I believe the side benefit is engaging in the uncomfortable behavior for its okay. own sake for its own sake yeah, you've boxed you've done movies you've yeah. done a lot of stuff yeah, a lot, this, a lot is, of stuff. this is why i uh i, I i'm not i'm not we're not a, we're not we the like same comfort species. We we're like not comfort. the same species no, we like comfort. yeah i don't even like a shirt with I a avoid, tag in it i avoid rubs. discomfort i try to avoid this i'm right there with you so yeah. we're never gonna yeah, yeah. and frankly not healthy i'm not healthy as a result i haven't gotten anywhere <laughs> It's not like I'm, I'm not the dream. I'm not the standard. We'll see who goes first. Isn't that a way out? Oh, he's that's going first. Oh, he's going, he's first. going for it. Yeah, Are you doing anything in death that's unusual? You like he freezing? races cars, races cars. Uh, I don't. That's not in death. But are you like freezing yourself? Are you composting yourself? Are you? Um, no, I figure there's enough AI and enough of me talking to a microphone where I can just keep the Whoa. podcast going for another thousand <laughs> yeah, right. years. Oh, that's right. right. You don't have to show up anymore. It's, a, it's about it. And you have kids, right? So they'll, they'll profit off of that for years and yeah, years. Yeah, let them come. wet their beak while yeah. daddy's <laughs> do, they, do they, do they follow you in this practice of, of trying the, uh, no, they're just children of comfort. You've spoiled that's them. That's right. The, yeah, children that's of comfort. Right. Boy, that should be our next TV show. Children of comfort. <laughs> <laughs> Lifestyles. Well, Adam, thanks for being gracious and, and coming on. I know you got to run. You got a heart out. You got to do your thing to millions of Thank people. Thank you, brother. So. Good to see you. Thanks, guys. Yeah, I'll thanks. see you both Always soon. Always good seeing you. All right. You. You Adam Carolla, care. ladies and gentlemen. Did he convince you? Would you do well, this? Okay, I'll tell you why I don't do it. Because you, you do know that I do research, right? I like go deep. Yeah. A lot of times it didn't even come up on the show, but cold has gone back to the Greeks and the Romans. Okay, they, 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 they use cold. But here's, I just looked up some health issues as far as gold plunge. Some unintended <laughs> side effects. And by the way, I know when I'm prepping this stuff, yeah. I can hear your voice in my head. So let me read you this, and where you're going to interrupt is exactly where I heard your voice in my head. Okay. Evidence supporting the health benefits of cold therapy remains scant. Experts caution that for some people, shocking the body with cold water could do more harm than good, even at less than frigid temperatures. The National Center for Cold Water Safety. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I visited it. <laughs> no, really? The last time I was in, where is it? Where, where is that uh, center? I think it's in Cold Water so City. The last time uh, I was at Cold Water City. <laughs> <laughs> was I heard you. Time. I just said the National Center for cold water safety. Yeah. Honey, I got the job. I'm the yeah. director of the cold water. No, that's the tepid water. Right. And that's the warm water, and that's the lukewarm yeah. water. This is the cold water I'm safety. in the Piscataway <laughs> office. <laughs> well, the National Center for Cold Water Safety, Yeah. who dedicates their lives sure. to cold water safety, Yeah. warns that sudden immersion in water under 60 degrees Fahrenheit can kill a person in less than a minute. How much money did we spend to support this organization to come up with that finding? <laughs> this is what. This is why this America not is good. always on the verge of bankruptcy. We invest in studies. Well, wait a minute. Hold like on. But hold it. Uh, Doctor Jorge Plutsky, wow, said that cold shock can be dangerous. 
He's the director of preventive cardiology to Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Whether their health benefits or not is not clear and has not been established. Here's what happens when you plunge in cold water. As you said in the beginning of the episode, yes. minus the extreme shrinkage. Yes. It triggers a sudden rapid increase in breathing, which you yes. said. Yes. Heart rate and blood pressure, known as the cold shock response, happen. Yes. That can cause a person to drown within seconds. Yes. If they involuntarily <laughs> gasp while their head is submerged. The shock also places stress on the heart and makes it work harder. Yeah. So the reason that I don't do the cold plunge <laughs> yeah. is pretty much that. Okay? We, have, we have talked about this before. My mother wouldn't let me get on a skateboard. Could you hear if I said, Ma, I got this daily regime now, I'm loving it. I go in freezing cold water and I stay there for as long as I can until it burns my skin. And then I come out and I feel great. Now, what it does say, I'm sure, is that there is a rush it of It can reduce, well, well here's what it can do. It, what can, it, it can do is re reduce inflammation. Right. And athletes use it to help, sure. well, ice baths and that, that yes. kind of stuff. But, and it, doc, as Dr. Plutsky says, you don't know if you got a, what if you have a pre existing condition and you go, I'm trying the ice plunge? That's your last, that's your I gotta last plunge. I got to tell you, I, I, you know, there are ways people are dealing with this because of anxiety. And I, I, I have never had depression, but I have not clinical depression. I, I had severe anxiety, as you know. Yes. And the reason why I think people do this stuff is the shock value. And, it, and it, you don't have to go in cold water because you know the story. I was having anxiety attacks during my Broadway run of Neil Simon's Broadway Bound. I was getting, uh, there was a period in the show where I just had to lay down on a bed and be still for about 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I was getting anxiety attacks during those 10 minutes. And to the point where I, my heart was beating, I had the, the cold sweats, I, I thought I was gonna die, I wanted to run off the stage, and they would get worse and worse and worse every night. I was embarrassed by it, I thought my career would be over, you know, I wouldn't be able to be an actor. I didn't tell anybody, I, you know. I finally, after about six weeks of this, confided in my acting teacher, because he was not only my teacher, but he's a friend of mine. And I said, Larry, I, I just gotta tell you, I'm having this crippling anxiety on stage. I think I'm gonna pass out. I think I'm gonna lose my mind. I'm worried I'm gonna ruin the show. I'm gonna ruin it for the audience. I'm gonna ruin my career. I'm gonna have to give up acting. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna do that. And I'm waiting for this very sympathetic response. And he turns around and, and he says to me, you know, you're a goddamn <laughs> egomaniac. I went, what? what? He said, it's all about you. You've made it all about you. This is gonna happen to you. This is gonna happen to you. You're gonna do this. You're gonna be that. He said, Jason, nobody gives a crap about you. People are there to hear the story. Tell them the goddamn story. Wow. And it was, it was the most cold, what I perceived as cold. It was a cold plunge. It was an emotional cold plunge. Response. You're expecting compassion or sympathy, and you'll get that. And I was really rattled by it. And I went to do the show that night. And it and fixed it. Didn't. I didn't get the anxiety attack that See, night. I didn't go right get it the next night, didn't get it the next night, and I've never, never had again. it again. And that was a sort of a one-time shock to my system where he did spin my head around. He said, look, you're, you're so in your head that you're making yourself crazy. And, it, and it, it's true. And perhaps that's the value of, of a shock to your system. You know what I think? But I don't get up every morning and go, hey, Larry, tell me I'm a goddamn egomaniac. <laughs> I tell you that every day. That's why we're partners. I go, you're nothing. That's your job. Um, you, well, my take on this, the real serious take on yeah. this, is that society today, because we got so much stuff coming in so fast, wants quick fixes. And quick fixes amounts to cutting corners. Well, sure. And that, that patience and is no longer rewarded. And we, we, we're not looking for the most effective solution. We're looking for the quickest fix in time. So yeah. I think all of these things, it's Silicon Listen, Valley. If it, if it help, that said, look, folks, people are out there trying all kinds of oh, things. Oh, God bless. If and it works success, for you. And if it's working for you, then it's working for you. And just not remember doctors, the words so of the Center know? for a Cold Water, whatever that was. Yeah. But they do in uh, Silicon Valley. Dopamine fasting is one of the newest buzz. Starving your body of food, sex, alcohol, social media, technology, anything else that might give you even a flicker of fun. So you cut oh, yourself sure. off yeah. and then you yeah. come back. Well, that's, that's, I live that. If that's a thing, I'm doing that. Organized <laughs> intimacy is the thing where you organize it. In other words. Is that the same as scheduling? Uh, yes. Eye contact <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> parties, cuddle parties, conscious oh, dance. I do that. Can I you schedule. Imagine? I, Can do, you imagine? I just schedule. I try, but I don't have anybody who wants to participate. My wife and I are on the books for about three and a half months from now. We have a date we night a big, in 20. We got a big one coming. In, you know, what's the next leap year? <laughs> got to tell you what some of the biggies in Silicon Valley eat for meals. Okay. Steve Jobs, the late founder of Apple, was known for eating habits. You know, he died of pancreatic cancer. But his, his, his eating habits 
he would eat only one or two foods at a time for weeks. Like for weeks, oh, that's he would, the Pendulette thing. Carrots and apples. Yeah, Penn did uh, potatoes or something. Well, he would do, if I understand correctly, Penn, when he, when he started his, he lost over 100 pounds. Um, he would eat one food and only one food for a week. I know potatoes was one of them. Um, that can't be healthy. Broccoli, I think. Can't be them. healthy. And by the yeah, way, jobs came, got, jobs came to regret that he didn't yeah. go traditional medicine. But he also is like Adam. He didn't shower regularly and didn't wear deodorant because he thought veganism would alleviate the smell. Uh, Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg, said he, he eats whatever he feels he would eat in that day because he doesn't like to waste time on small decisions. This is what big guys, I'll eat it. It's there. I'm eating it now. Um, well, in that way, I'm very Zuckerberg. <laughs> okay, except that then he changed. Remember what he did? No. He changed his personal challenge in 2011 to only eat meat from animals he killed himself. So people would come over so and, and he'd have goat. He'd have goat. Yeah. And Jack Dorsey from Twitter said it was cold goat, so I passed. Dorsey ate two hard-boiled eggs with soy sauce every day. That's his thing. Used to be a vegan. Uh, too much, too much beta carotene. He turned orange. So he stays. <laughs> that he happened to my it. wife. She turned orange. She, she was. You know, Dana eats very healthily, but right. she, she for a while there, she was eating a lot, a lot of um, sweet potatoes and carrots. And not only did she turn orange, but if you took a tissue and sort of wiped her skin, if she was a little damp, you you get orange on the skin. I mean, literally, it was coming out of it her was pores. coming out of her pores. Yeah. Elon Musk doesn't usually eat breakfast. When he does, he'll eat a Mars chocolate bar, because you know, I guess he's going to take that into space. He said, I, "I inhale it in five minutes." He focuses on dinner, which takes place while he's working. He never stops, never stops to eat. And Bezos had at one conference a Mediterranean octopus with potatoes, bacon, green garlic, yogurt, and poached egg for breakfast. Sure. But it was a lesson. He used it as a metaphor for Amazon's business strategy. You ready? If yeah. you can get this down. You're the octopus that I'm having for breakfast. When I look at the menu, you're the thing I don't understand. The thing I've never had. I must have the breakfast octopus. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't that get you? Now you understand Elon Musk better, you right? You know... <laughs> These guys take everything I seriously. I once put some Fruit Loops in my oatmeal. Does that count as anything? Bill when Gates. They write the story of me. Bill Gates eats Cocoa Puff cereal for breakfast. <laughs> Cocoa Puff cereal. Cocoa Puff cereal. You know what Jerry Seinfeld got me into? I never did it before I met him. The cereal combining. I had never done it. He made an art out of it. We had, you know, we talked about our crazy catering. There'd be 20 different kinds cereal of cereal. combining? Yeah, a little bit. You put... You know, maybe a third of a cup of cocoa puffs and some fruit well, loops, I'll do that. some special K for you, the health and the fiber. You know why I do that? I grape do nuts. You know, if I got, and you mix them all up, a well, melange. Well, you have to because you can't eat. Grape nuts is like eating gravel. I love grape nuts. I like it mixed with other cereal. Grape nuts, if you're listening, sponsor our you're show. Right. Grape I nuts. will eat it on the air. I'll eat it all through the I actually love grape nuts. My, tastes like a wild hickory nut. Who was that? Remember that guy? Come on. Yule Gibbons. Yule Gibbons. That's How do right, I know that? You know, that's taken up space in my mind right. for important stuff. That's Why like, did I remember again, that? I, I do so much Jerry Seinfeld reference on this. You know, it's weird. I but can't remember my wife's sister's name, but I remember right. Yule Gibbons. That's because really scary. Because things in commercials, we just accept. I'm Yule Gibbons, and I say it to, And you go, I never heard of Yule Gibbons, my but favorite, now he's my authority. My favorite. My favorite that Jerry said was, Certs, now with more <laughs> Retson. <laughs> And he goes, we didn't know what Retson was <laughs> before. Now we're going, more Retson? <laughs> How much Retson? My favorite, my favorite commercial parody was Robert Klein, who we worked with on a TV show. Yeah. Did the hair, hair club for men guy. He was bald and right, he had the right. thing on. He goes, it's undetectable. And, and Klein would go, and what possible would he, reason would the CEO of the company have to lie to you? <laughs> to misrepresent. So, All right, let's wrap this sucker up. Well, thank you, Adam Carolla. Thank you for uh, spending some time with us. And uh, ice plunge. Remember, yeah. Tomorrow, when you when you when your testicles are coming up into your throat, please think of me and Peter fondly. Uh, thank you for watching. Thank you, David Guggen. The thank hell? you, Laurie Kirby the and the boys here. Uh, every Tuesday, we have a new episode for you. Uh, you can find them on the iHeart app, the Apple app, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you are watching on YouTube, and we hope you do. Please remember to like and subscribe. If you have a Really No Really that you have seen, experienced, or heard of, send it to us at wow. our website, reallynoreally.com. And if we use it on the air, maybe you'll, you'll meet uh, Adam Carolla. Who knows? Maybe. No? I thought you were going to get all the way through it without a fumfer. <laughs> that a fumfer. wasn't a fumfer. Right, that was right. a turn. Really No Really. Home of the tepid plunge. See you next time. Oh, I like it.